God bless Thank you. Thank you, Brother Littlefield. And good evening to all. The audience is both visible and invisible. We have deemed this a great privilege of having these three days of service in your fair city. And I said if there was anywhere in this country I'd like to live would be here at Cleveland because it's a great religious center. This morning I had the privilege of dedicating a new church in Cleveland and its congregation dedicated their lives anew to the service of the Lord. We had a glorious time yes, this morning. I want to thank Brother Littlefield, Brother Hall, and all the, the uh, pastors here in the auditorium tonight and those who have, some of them has dismissed their churches for the service. I thank you very kindly, brethren, for your kind cooperation and, and consideration for the gospel and revival in our times. I want to thank also the radio station which is broadcasting this service. And as I said last night, we were on the road over tonight, wife and I was listening again to the, the programs as we do. I sure would love to be close to where this radio station was. So I believe that the influence that music puts upon children, it would pay every Christian throughout radio land that this uh, radio reaches to keep their radios tuned to such a station as this tonight because it brings the right kind of an influence through music and through preaching of the word to our children. It sets them in a better environment. Also, I want to thank the police force for their fine cooperation. Last evening I met one of the young police out here that shook my hand, once the Christian, and he said he had fallen away from God, had been to my tabernacle at Jeffersonville. I certainly pray for that young man. God will bring him back to the fold. I told him a little story. That a man said one time, I got away from John 3.16, but John 3.16 never did get away from me. It'll stay with you. Now, to the school. I want to thank the school for letting us have this auditorium for the service. May the Lord bless them and all you that have come and made this possible, the laity and the fine compliments from the people throughout Radio Land. For the testimonies of their healing and so forth, I am grateful to God for all these things. Usually the last night brings forth a better results when it comes to the healing services or prayer for the sick because there's great anticipation, the people waiting and pressing, knowing that they want to get healed. And when a person begins to hunger and to thirst after righteousness, then God moves in. That turns his heart. And now, the gospel of our Lord is not the most popular thing in the world. Frankly, it's very unpopular. But I count it and deem it such a privilege to stand for the full gospel that Jesus Christ died for, to preach it and to believe it and live it. And now tonight, I know it's very hot in the uh, auditorium here, and it's things that we cannot help, but we will try to make the message just as short as possible and get into the prayer line because we promise to pray for many people tonight. I want to say this. If any of you in here believe in sending prayer claws one to another according to Acts 19, or they taken from the body of Paul handkerchiefs and aprons, and laid them upon the sick, and they were healed. To me, I believe that every word of the Bible is true. What God did once, he will do again. I believe this, that God is infinite, and when and we are finite. And when God is called on the scene to act, 
And the way God acts when he's called on the scene, he must forever act the same way if he's called under the same circumstances again. Like this, if God ever was called on the scene to save a sinner, and the attitude that God taken towards that sinner, he'll have to take the same attitude towards the next sinner and every sinner that ever comes before him. If anyone comes sick and he heal them, he must take the same attitude forever. Because we being finite, we can make a mistake, say, oh, I was a mistake, but God's infinite and his words are perfect. And the way he acted first, if he don't act the next time and every time after, the way he acted first, then he acted wrong in the first place. He was wrong to forgive the first sin if he won't forgive every sin. He was wrong when he healed the first person if he will, if he won't heal every person that comes to him. God just requires to you to come his provided way. And his way is Calvary to his son, Jesus Christ. Now, it isn't how much we can sing, how well we can preach, how much we can shout. It's coming God's provided way. If you had an artesian well on one hill, blowing out water on the other hill, you had a crop burning up. Now, you can stand on the hill where the crop is and holler, great well, spring your water over to me and water my crop so I can have food. You could holler until you could holler no more. It wouldn't act. But if you'll work according to the laws of gravitation, you can bring that water right around to your crop. There's enough electricity and, and any room to light it up. But you can holler, great electricity, I'm conscious you're here, light up this room. No. You've got to work according to the laws of electricity. And then it'll light up the room. And the same way it is, we are conscious that God is here. God doesn't heal the people just by going to church or making confession. He heals you up on your faith in his finished work. That's the only basis that he can heal you. And if you'll believe that, it's not the touch of the minister's hands. It's not the anointing of the oil. It's not the prayer that he prays so much as it is your faith to accept the finished work that Christ did for you. That's God's law. Then if you can believe that, all things are possible to them that believe. And now if you desire a prayer cloth, just write me at Jeffersonville, Indiana, and I'll get it. Now I'm not trying to get your address because I do not have any programs to support. I never did let my meetings get to that place where I have to have thousands of dollars. I don't have to have anything. Only thing I need is just more of God. And then my expenses, talking with Brother Roberts not long ago, I think his expenses runs around $10,000 a day. Billy Grimm's, I think, was running $28,000 uh, for a few minutes in his broadcast and television and so forth all around the world. What would I do if I had to make, take money like that? I've been preaching 30 years. I've never tucked one offering in my life. I don't let my meetings get in that condition. I just keep them humble where I can go to a little bitty church, four or five, or wherever the Lord will call. I'm only wanting to help you. If you want a prayer cloth that I've prayed over, just send to Jeffersonville, and I'll send it back to you free of charge. It's nothing. I might say this. The rain won't fall too hard and the night get too dark, but I'll be glad to offer prayer for you any time I can or do something to help you. The Lord bless you. My prayer. Now let us bow our heads just before we read the word. O Lord, the great God of heavens and earth, who brought again the Lord Jesus from the dead, raised him up on the third day according to the scriptures and he sits now at the right hand of the majesty on high no more dead but ever alive to make intercessions upon our confession the high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities 
We humbly come because we have been bidden to come. For he did tell us in his word, Ask the Father anything in my name, I'll do it. Therefore, Lord, we first want to thank you for what you have done for us in these last three services. You have blessed our hearts with your presence and has healed the sick and has given salvation to those that were thirsting for God. We pray, O oh Lord, tonight that you'll double the potion tonight by filling every heart with the Holy Spirit, giving healing to those that are sick and needy, blessing us all together. And as we are praying, we would not forget those that are in the hospitals and infirmed in the convalescent homes. Many of them in the old age stage that maybe their loved ones and many of their associates nearly all has gone upstairs. But we have this glorious consolation that he will never forsake us or leave us alone. When we are growing old and feeble, He'll stand by us even through the valley of the shadows of death. Bless us together, forgive our sins, and speak to us, Lord, through thy word as we wait upon it. Bless this church and all that's represented here, this radio, the station, and all that is concerned for we ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus, thy Son, our Savior. Amen. I have chosen for a text tonight found in the book of First Kings, the 17th chapter and the 14th verse. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel will not waste, nor the cruse run dry until the day that the Lord God sends rain upon the earth. You know God's people has always been in the minority. Not always in the majority. And I'm speaking of the chosen and the elected, God's chosen people. And it's always a strange thing to me how that people that have accepted Christ is afraid to trust him, afraid that there might be something they're not sure of. And I'm going to make my text tonight, Be Certain of God. It must have been a hot morning. It was along about daybreak. All night long she had prayed. For death was strolling at the door. And this nation was backslidden. People were starving in the streets and the water fountains had dried up. And there had been three years not even moisture had fell on the ground by the dew. It showed up moral decay in the nation. It reflected the sins of the people. It was during the time of the reign of Ahab, Israel's most wicked king. He had married a sinner, Jezebel, a beautiful modern movie star, very indifferent towards the kingdom of God. 
And he being one of these kind of husbands that lets the wife run the house and run his business, showed that he was backslid. Then being an Israelite, he'd give in to her idolatry. And between them, they had brought all the nation to idolatry. And when you start on the wrong road, you'll never be able to be reconciled till you come right back to the place where you left God. Some time ago, a chaplain told me that he found a man laying on the field, an officer, and he had been machine gunned across his chest. He was dying. And he said to him, Captain, you are dying. And through the struggles, he said, I know I am. He said, do you know God? He said, I used to. He said, well, go back to where you left him and there you'll find him again. And the captain dying said, I, I just can't think right now. The chaplain said, you'd better think. For your lungs are fastly filling with your own blood and you're dying, Captain. And he began to try to think. After a while, a smile come over his face. He said, oh, Chaplain, I remember now where I left him. Said, start from right there, Captain. Said, all right, Chaplain. He raised his eyes towards heaven and he started like this. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Amen. And if I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And he died. Where did he leave him? At the cradle. That's where he found him. At the cradle. Wherever you leave him, that's where you'll find him. He'll never walk in sin with you. You might be a good American or a good church member, but God will never walk in sin with any person or any nation or any church. He cannot uh, tolerate sin. It's an evil, horrible stink in his nostrils. He will not do it. He have it done wrong. Marrying this woman, marrying a sinner, unbeliever. The word sin means unbelief. I was speaking some time ago and I said, committing adultery is not sin. Drinking whiskey is not sin. I was at the Henryville Methodist Church and a precious old sister stood up and she said then, Brother Branham, what is sin? I said, unbelief. You commit adultery and drink whiskey and lie and steal because you do not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Those things are attributes of unbelief. When you have received Christ, you do not do those things. You have love, joy, peace, long-suffering. That is the fruits of the Spirit. The attributes of the Holy Spirit that dwells in you. All these things have long left Ahab because he married this sinner girl. Oh, she was very sexy, like these modern girls of today. It proved it after her husband was dead. She dressed herself and twisted out before Jehu thought she could vamp that man of God. But he said, pour out of the window. We had more men like Jehu today would have less Jezebels. But that was her nature, and she was a worshiper of idolatry. And she brought the whole nation to idolatry. And so has our modern trend today, falling away from the things of God, and it's brought the world to one of the greatest idolatries that we have, that's idleness. Just idling around. Great is the 
iniquity of the people today, making plenty of money, and think that God's a blessing us because He's prosperous. That's no sign of God's blessings. Not at all. But they were prospered and they were told by the government, the church was, that it was all right. The government, Ahab and his kingdom, said these things are all right. So they had become morally decayed. And it's not much different today. Our government has an endorsed selling whiskey, selling tobacco, and our doctors say to cigarettes, cancer by the carton, and the government says, go ahead and sell it for revenue. You think God could bless on the top of that? I read in the Reader's Digest recently that the doctor pronounced how many tens of thousands of Americans this year were doomed to death because of smoking cigarettes. How many the insane institution will take this year because of drinking whiskey? How many homes will be broke up because of modern drinking? Sociable drinks, selling whiskey, beer, just at random. And tens of thousands of church members indulge in it. How can we ever expect God to bless that? But as it was in the days of Ahab, so is it now. The government said it's all right. So they wanted to be modern. Oh, the call had been so great until the modern preacher had broke down and give in to it. That's the way it is today. Modern preachers just break down because their congregation won't put up with it to preach the gospel in the power of the resurrection and the old-fashioned baptism of the Holy Spirit cleaning up a man's life. Amen. They put them out and get a preacher that will preach things that they want to hear. I ought to be their pastor a little bit. Some woman got on me a few days ago because I made a remark about the modern Americans wearing these ladies, wearing these immoral clothes. How they come down the streets with little skirts on that, like they were poured into them. And all sexy dressed. And she said, Mr. Branham, that's the only kind of dress that you can buy in the store. I said, your excuse is thinner than the broth made out of a shadow of a chicken to starve to death. I said, they still sell sewing machines and goods. You don't have to do it. Because you want to do it. Let me say this to you here and also in Radio Land. You might be as pure as the lily to your husband or to your boyfriend. But if you dress and get out on the street like that and sinners look at you to lust after you, you have going to answer at the day of judgment for committing adultery with that man. You will be turned down at the day of judgment. And whose fault is it? Not the sinner, it's your fault for pushing yourself out in front of him like that. Modern patterns of Jezebel. That was the dark ages of the Hebrews. This is the dark ages of the Gentiles. Oh, but there was one during that time, a little number of people, a poor little widow woman in the city, and a prophet sitting up on the hill, fed by the crows. Ahab hated him, and so did Jezebel. They wouldn't have given him a drink of water if he was dying. But God was taking care of him. The Christian looks to God for his care, not to the world. Some ministers look to their congregation for a meal ticket, preach what the congregation wants them to preach. 
I'd rather lay on my stomach and eat soda crackers and drink branch water and preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus than to have fried chicken and live in the best house there is in the city. Right. Be right with God. That's the great thing. Preach the whole word. Tell people of their sins. You'll be hated. Reminds me of a little parable I tell of my children. I got two little girls. One of them's name is Rebecca. She's my firstborn. And Sarah, her little sister, is next. Rebecca's about 12 years old, skinny, long-legged. And Sarah is a little short girl. She's seven years old. And one night, I place it like this. I was coming home from meetings and they'd waited up a long time to, to see me. And they got sleepy and had to go to bed. I come in weary and tired and worn. I laid down to sleep sometime after midnight. And along before daylight, I couldn't sleep and I got up early to keep from waking the wife up. Went out into the parlor and sat down in a chair. And as I was sitting there thinking of the meetings and praying for the different ones who had asked me request, I heard a scramble in the children's bedroom. Here come the door bursting open and here come Rebecca just as hard as she could go. And she jumped up, straddled my knee and her long legs reached down to the floor. She threw her arms around me and began to hug me. Then I heard something falling, stumbling over the rugs. Sarah was behind her. And she was wearing Rebecca's hand-me-down pajamas with the feet much too long and she couldn't stand up good with them on. And she was stumbling. And when Rebecca got seated real good, her long legs reaching down to the floor, I thought, well, this is for some cause. And Rebecca reminded me of the church that's all settled, knows all of its doctrine, been in for a long time, well seated. She turned around to her little sister, Sarah, and Sarah was at the door there of the hall. She said, Sarah, I want to tell you something. She threw both arms around me and she said, I've got all of daddy. And there's none left for you. And little Sarah, like the minority church, her little lips dropped down, her little brown eyes begin to water. Because Becky had all of Daddy, and she loved Daddy too. So I stuck out my other leg to her and motioned my finger. Oh, her little eyes brightened up. Here she'd come with them little pajama feet flying, jumped right to straddle my leg. And she's like the minority church. She wasn't so settled down with great denominations behind her. And she was kind of tottering. I was afraid she was going to fall. So I took both arms and put them around her. I hugged her up to my bosom. She snugged down close to me for a few minutes. Then she turned those little bright eyes up to her sister, Rebecca, and she said, Rebecca, my sister, I want to tell you something. She said, it is the truth that you've got all of daddy, but I want you to know that daddy's got all of me. That's the way I want it. I may not know all the grammar and all the Greek and all the Hebrew, but all I want to know that Christ has got all of me. I want to be so completely insufficient that I can feel his arms around me. Elijah might have not all, all the laws of the land, but God had complete control of him. Around about daybreak, all night it had been horrible. 
See, she'd been gradually getting lower and lower in the meal. And that night she knew that when she put him to bed, her little boy, his father was gone. She was a righteous woman, a God-fearing woman. And that night I can see them as they knelt down to pray. And as she looked at his little pajama arms and they were threadbare, his little face was marred from hunger. She'd give her part to him because she knowed just a little longer and they'd be gone. There was no bread in the land, there was no meal, there was no oil, there was no rain. But yet she trusted God. She couldn't sleep. Every once in a while he'd turn over and say, Mama, won't you go out to the cupboard and look one more time and see if there's just one bite of that bread left? I'm so hungry, I can't sleep. How she'd bite her lips until they would bleed. She'd go out in the kitchen and raise up her hands and say, Oh, Jehovah, I am a widow who believes in you. And you took the little boy's father, your servant, up into heaven to be with you. And if you don't help me, it won't be long till we'll be visiting him. Nevertheless, whatever you do, I love you just the same and I trust you. It seems strange when a person has done all that they can do, that they have fulfilled every request that God has asked them to do, and still he is silent. When you have done all that God has requested you to do and still he's silent, just be sure that you know God. And remember, faith is silently waiting. He's only testing your faith to see what you'll do. God does that. It was the Hebrew children that believed God and stood out for God. And they were sure that they were right with God. And he let them walk right into the fiery furnace before he ever moved. But faith waits silently, assured that everything's all right. When you've done all that you can do, when you've come to the prayer line and been prayed for, your heart doesn't condemn you and you're living right with God. Just hold on to it. God has to answer. He's testing you. If you turn loose the next morning and say, well, I'm no better. I guess there's nothing to it. Then you didn't have faith to begin with. If you've got real faith, you'll hold to the last breath gone from your body. You're certain that God is God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. He, Job, when Job was accused of being a secret sinner, when his flesh was rotting from his body and his children had been killed and his, uh, he was poverty stricken, he still knew that he was right before God and he held on. God was testing him. When even his wife come out and he is sitting in the backyard on the ash heap, scraping his sores with the boil, the boils with a piece of crop or something. And his wife, the only one of his family left, said, Job, why don't you curse God and die? You look so miserable. He said, Thou speakest like a foolish woman. The Lord gave and the Lord taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. God was testing him. He knew he had offered the burnt offering. He'd come by the way of the blood. He knew that God was God. He knew that God answered prayer. And God was testing him.
but he brought him out victorious because he was certain of God. If you're certain of God, you can take his word for anything he says. If you're not certain that he is God, and this is the Bible, then you better be careful what you're doing. But if you're certain, meet his requirements, then faith takes its solemn rest. Faith cannot be based upon the shifting sand of man's theology. But faith takes its solemn stand upon the eternal, everlasting rock of God's eternal faith. There it rests, unmovable. It knows that God is and a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Oh, it was horrible to watch her child dying. All night she had prayed, but she had waited. Then I see her take a little nap, wake up, and she looks at his little thin body. He's dozed off to sleep. She's seen the great ditches in his face from hunger, and she could hardly stagger around. Just about a bucket of water left, one handful of meal and a spoonful of oil stood between her and death. Is it strange how God lets his children get right down to that last moment? <laughs> Sometimes he permits that to see your reaction. The Bible said, if we cannot stand the chastisement of God, then we are illegitimate and not the children of God. We're born by the Spirit of God. Our faith in God holds on his word. Sets to his word and there it holds. Now watch. She goes to the kitchen. She scrapes down in the barrel and gets that little handful of meal. She said he'll wake up in a few minutes crying. I'll cook the meal and then he'll have his little breakfast, whatever it is, a little corn cake. Then I'll take him in my arms and rock him until death takes us both. Now she went to the last thing she had was meal. Now meal in the Bible represents the meal offering. The meal offering was Christ. Christ was the meal offering in the Old Testament. Do you remember when Elijah, some of the school of the preachers up there didn't know the difference between wild gourds and peas? Up at the school of the seminary? And they went out and gathered an apron full of them and put them in a pot. And uh, some cried out, there's death in the pot. And Elijah took a handful of meal and threw it into the pot and changed it from death to life. That's what Christ does when he's put on the case of a dying man. He changes him from death to life. The meal offering had to be ground with a certain burr. That burr had to be so perfect that it ground every grain of corn just the same. Showing that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. She got the meal. Christ. Christ is the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The Word, then the oil. The oil represents His Holy Spirit. And she took the Holy Spirit, the Word, and the truth. Jesus said the time's coming to the woman at the well that God will honor those who worship Him in spirit and in truth. Many people worship in spirit and not in truth. Many in truth and not in spirit. But when you get them together... Then you've got something. When the Spirit of God gets into the Word, she mixed it together. And when you get the Spirit of God on you, mixed with God's Word, something's going to happen. The doctor might have sent you home to die with a cancer. And all the man knows, he's done everything that he knows in his knowledge of the books of learning to save your life. He wants to see you live. But maybe he don't know no more. 
But you take God's word tonight and mix it with the spirit of faith. Watch what will take place. She began to mix this. Now, it won't mix good unless it's got some fire under it. It has to bake it into a bread which makes life. And when she got her little meal and oil mixed together, the word and the spirit, then something said, go out into the yard. At the same time, the Holy Spirit up on top of the mountain, where this old prophet had been sitting up there, said, go down to the city, for I've got a widow down there. I've ordained her to sustain you. She must have been a righteous woman or God had never sent his prophet to stay with her. But God knows your needs. She went out into the yard. The prophet took off towards the city with the vision, trying to find a yard that had a woman in it. And he was walking down the streets looking for the vision that the Lord had showed him. And the same time she come out of the house, did you notice she picked up two sticks? Two sticks was the cross. I'm a hunter. And any good hunter knows that the right way to burn a log at night is to light a cross log and just keep pushing the ends in. She had to light that, then put the meal and oil together, and that was the Word, the Spirit, with the fire of the Holy Ghost to bake it into a whole cake of life-giving substance she picked up the two sticks and she started back into the house to put the oil and the meal over the fire and she heard a voice and when she turned there was a gentle looking old man whiskers all over his face bald headed leaning over a gate with a piece of sheepskin wrapped around him. And he said, Would you fetch me just a little drink of water? What's the God-fearing person always willing to divide? She looked at him. He was just a little different than lots of men. And there's something about a Christian that's different. I can imagine her saying, that voice just sounds real good to me. She nodded her head in politeness that she would go get some water and divide it with him. And as she started to go, she heard the voice again and said, in your hand, fetch me a little morsel of bread. Then she turned. And no doubt with tears in her eyes, she said this. Sir, that's why I was out in the yard to get these two sticks. I've just got a handful of meal and a spoonful of oil. I've mixed it together and dressed it. And I've got these two sticks to make a fire and bake a little cake for my son and I. We are going to eat it and die. And she looked at him, and he said, but first, make me a cake. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all other things will be added unto you. Put God first, put his word first, put his spirit first, put him first. Instead of that, we put him last. Bring me a little cake first. What's she going to do? See if she's obedient to the word. She turns and starts, not knowing why she's doing it. Men and women who are led by the Spirit of God sometimes do things they don't know they're doing. Turned and started into the house. And then she heard that voice again. That glorious word come from his mouth, Thus saith the Lord. She knew who it was then. 
The barrel will not be empty, neither shall the cruise run dry until the day the Lord God sends rain on the earth. Why? She was willing. She put God first. She was sure that God would do something. She held on. Many times that trouble strike our homes, it's blessing in disguisement. Some people might say, well, you're sick. It's because you're not right with God. That doesn't mean that. Job was right with God and he was sick. But it's God testing you. Putting you to a test to see what you'll do. Maybe he let the doctor say that for a purpose. To see what you'd do. We're near the coming of the Lord. God's coming for our church. He never asked and question, will I have a church? Will I have righteousness? But here was a question Jesus asked, will I find faith when I come? God's putting you to a test maybe, to try your faith. And all of her trouble and death at the door, turn with one, thus saith the Lord. She and her son and Elijah Eat many days from the barrel, and it never did waste, neither did the cruise run dry. Because she was certain of God. It reminds me of a German painting in Germany. It's like the great picture of the betrayal at Forest Lawn. So large, they had to build a mammoth big half a million dollar building to put the painting in. The German painting is called the cloud. And when you're away away from this picture, it is the most dis miserable, dismal looking sight. It's a bunch of clouds just mixing together. And as you start walking to that picture, it gives you a horror. Oh, what a dreadful sight it looks. But when you get close to it, it's angels' wings beating together. See, it looks different when you get there. Maybe that's the way it is with you tonight. You don't know just why you are sick. You don't know just why or what about this. But maybe it is a blessing in disguise. It looks like a gloomy dark end for you, but it may be the angel wings beating together if you're only certain of God. You're sure that God heals the sick. If you're sure that God still pours out the Holy Ghost upon his people, then take his promise and hold on to it until God answers. For he sure will answer prayer. Let us bow our heads now while we think of this. Are you certain that it's God's will to save you. You in Radio Land, think of it. Is it the will of God to save you? Are you certain it is? You sinner man, maybe at the pool room or at the bar room, out in the car with the other man's wife drinking, you there with a cigarette in your mouth, are you certain that God is God of holiness? that can forgive your sins and take all your iniquity away? Are you here in this audience that doesn't know Christ as your Savior? Are you certain tonight that God forgives the sinner? You without the Holy Spirit, both here and in Radio Land, are you certain that it's God's will to give you the Holy Spirit? Are you certain the scriptures are inspired when Peter said, Repent every one of you and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins? And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children, to them that's far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Are you certain of that? Are you certain, you sick people, that Jesus was wounded for your transgressions, bruised for your iniquities? The chastisement of your peace was up on him, and with his stripes you were healed. Are you certain it's God? It's God's will. If you are, 
ask him for whatever you have need of just now while we pray, and you will receive it. How many in the visible audience will raise up your hand and say, Brother Branham, I have a need of God tonight. I raise my hand to say that I have need of God. May God grant it to me. I want you to remember me in prayer. You're in the visible audience. Raise your hand. You in Radio Land, raise up your hand. Wherever you are, in the hospital, wherever. Say, Lord, be merciful to me. I need you. And I'm certain that you are. Your son, Jesus, died to give me the desire of my heart. For he completely redeemed me back to the place where we fell at the Garden of Eden. I now will accept it. Let us pray. Gracious Jehovah, the God of Elijah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who brought again Jesus' his son from the dead, raised him up for a propitiation of our sins and has raised him for our justification. And the poet well expressed it when he said, Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. Someday he's coming, oh glorious day. Lord, look at those hands around this country just now that been raised up to you. You know the heart of men and women, boys and girls, grant, Lord, that the Holy Spirit will not leave one of them out, but shall give to each one according to their needs. And we know that we have your word saying, according to their faith they shall receive. Give to them faith tonight, Lord, and may they be certain that every promise of God is true. If they'll only wait, for it is written, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as an eagle. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Lord, teach us to wait upon thee lay hold of eternal life and every promise in the bible and wait upon thee for salvation of our souls for the baptism of the holy spirit for joy in our hearts for healing of our bodies for every redemptive blessing that you died for at calvary let us have faith tonight to know that God did not cause Christ to suffer in vain. That was for all generations. For it is written, whosoever will, let him come. While we are coming, Lord, grant that we will receive. For we ask it in Jesus' name, thy Son, as we commit it to thee. Amen. I love that song that the organ is now playing so sweetly, Only Believe. How many knows who wrote that song? A buddy of mine, Paul Rader. I was a little boy, just ordained in the Baptist church as I sat at Paul's feet. Not long ago, I was at the Rediger Tabernacle at Fort Wayne. Paul preached the same message I preach right here, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He believed in divine healing, the power of God, the second coming. When he was dying out in the hospital in Los Angeles, when the Moody Bible School sent down the quartet to sing for him, they had the shades all at the windows. Paul had a sense of humor. He said, who's dying here, me or you? They were singing near my God to thee. He said, raise them shades and sing me some snappy gospel songs. So they got to singing down at the cross where my Savior died. Down there for cleansing from sin I cried. There to my heart was the blood applied, oh glory to his name. Paul said, where's Luke? That was his brother. His brother and he roamed together through the fields preaching the gospel as my son and I go together. 
And Luke was in the next room. He didn't want to see his brother die. He said, tell Luke to come here. And Luke came in the room. He got a hold of Luke's hand. He said, Luke, we've come a long ways together, brother. We've took a many a battle for the Lord. But think of it, Luke. In five minutes from now, I'll be standing in the presence of Jesus Christ, clothed in his righteousness. Squeezed his brother's hands and went to meet God. Lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime with partings lead behind us footprints on the sands of time. Footprints that perhaps another sailing over life's solemn main for a full long and shipwrecked brother seen shall take heart again. We make footprints for somebody to walk in. Let's be gallant soldiers of faith as we sang Paul's song tonight. May he listen from heaven if it's possible for a righteous man to listen in as we sang only believe as we worship God. Only believe be certain of God. Hold on. Only believe. All things are possible. Only believe. Only believe. Only believe. So present, I wonder if you'd hold your hand and sing this with me like this. Now I believe. Now I believe. All things are possible. Now I believe. Will you raise your hand to God and sing it with me? Now I I believe God. I'm going to hold on. Now. Let's hum it like this. Now I receive. Do you hear? Receive his word. Now I receive. All things are us. Every promise. Now. Receive Christ in my heart. Now I receive. Oh, now I receive. All things are possible. Now I receive. Now. I want you to know, friends, as we're closing this meeting, if you have accepted Christ as your Savior or you've been a wandering star, and tonight you've accepted Christ or in this meeting to come home to Him, go back to your church. Please do. If you had no church, find you one. If you don't have any choice, Brother Littlefield never told me to say this, but Brother Littlefield, I know to be a man of God. I know Brother Hall to be a man of God. I know these brethren here, many of them, to be man of God. Join the church. They'll do you good. I can only be an evangelist. That's my calling. They're pastors to feed you and to shepherd you until Jesus comes. They're the caretaker at the end. 
Jesus give them two pence, the Word and the Spirit. If they need anything more, he'll give it when he returns. You know the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, we are going to pray for the sick. Now, I'll, is there any here that's never seen, been in one of my meetings before where I prayed for the sick? Raise your hand. Just a very few. Well, I might make this quotation quickly. That I believe and stand on this that Jesus Christ is not dead, but he's alive. I believe that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same in principle, the same in power. The only difference he is, he's in us now. In the form of the Holy Spirit, for he was in one man, Jesus Christ, when he was here on earth. But he sent his Holy Spirit back, and it's in all the church, universal. All the believers. Now, I believe the same things that he did, he promised we should do too. Now, last night, as I went into it, you see that sign of the Messiah was only done to the, the Jews and the Samaritans, not to the Gentiles. The Gentiles wasn't looking for the coming of Christ. Now, the Jews and Samaritans is not receiving it, but the Gentiles are receiving it. Why? It's the Gentiles looking for the coming of Christ. See, God, if that's the way he did it first, made himself known as Messiah by discerning their thoughts, telling the woman at the well she had husbands and uh, eagle eagle and telling Peter who his name was and the other things like that. And by that, not by healing the sick, they healed the sick before that. But they know he was the prophet that Moses spoke would come, the God prophet. How many understands that? Raise up your hand. And they said, by this we know you are the Messiah. The woman at the well, she was a prostitute, but she knew more about the Bible than half the preachers in America. That's right. The preachers of that day. Well, that preacher said, this man's a fortune teller. That's the reason he can discern her thoughts. And Jesus said, you speak that against me, it'll be forgiven. But when the Holy Spirit comes and does the same thing, speak against that, it'll never be forgiven. That's blasphemy. Because they called the spirit that he had in him an unclean spirit. Call the spirit of God, the works of the spirit of God, a devil, Beelzebub. He said it's unforgivable. Now if you're spiritual, you've caught these messages that I've been preaching. How last night they sent to Beelzebub, the god of Akron, to consult him. You should be spiritual enough to understand which is right and wrong. What speaks and what isn't? Did you ever see a spiritualist preaching the gospel and healing the sick? No, sir. Satan can't cast out Satan. The devil can't heal. Jesus said if Satan can cast out Satan, then his kingdom is divided. Satan cannot heal. God's the only one can heal. God's the only creator. Satan can pervert what God's created. And what is unrighteousness? Righteousness perverted. Here, let me say it. We're a mixed multitude. But I'm your brother. You listen to your doctor. You married me. You live with your wife as a wife. It's the bed is undefiled. But another woman can do the same act and you'll go to hell for doing it. The same act but perverted. All unrighteousness. What is a lie is the truth misrepresented. All the devil can do is to pervert Righteousness. He cannot create. He's not a creator. God's the only creator. So it takes creation to heal, and God's the only healer. Jesus, when he was here, he said, I'll do nothing till the Father shows me. He saw a vision. Everything that he did, he said, I'll do nothing except the Father shows me first. St. John 5, 19. So it was by vision. Now, he promised those things. He told his disciples, when, you, when the Holy Spirit's come, don't you do that before the Gentiles. Do it before the house of Israel. The day would come for the Gentiles. Now is their day. So if God introduced himself that way, the Messiah, and the woman, when she seen Jesus tell her that, she said, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. We know when the Messiah cometh, he'll tell us all these things. But who are you? He said, I'm he that speaks to you. 
She ran into the city and said, Come see a man who told me the things that I've done. Isn't this the Messiah? If that was a sign of the Messiah then at the closing of their age, he's got to give the same Messiah sign today. If it isn't, it isn't the same Messiah. The same grapevine will bring forth grapes. You don't see pumpkins coming off of a grapevine. Watermelons off of cantaloupe vines. You find watermelons on watermelon vines. Grapes on grapevines and pumpkins on pumpkin vines. And you find the Spirit of Christ in the children of Christ. We go to church to find the Spirit of Christ and we find creeds. We find laws and documents. God's Spirit, the same Spirit within Jesus Christ is in the church. If I told you I had the Spirit of Al Capone, you better call the police in and arrest me. I might have a gun. If I told you I had the Spirit of some famous artist, you'd expect me to paint these hills out here just as natural as they are. Because that's what the artist would do if I had his Spirit. If I had the Spirit of Christ, I'll do the works of Christ. Jesus said, if I do not the works of my Father, then believe me not. If the church does not do the works of Christ, then don't believe that church. Jesus said, these signs shall follow them that believe. And we've perverted it by works of man, doctrines of man. The Bible said in the last days to be heady, high-minded lovers of pleasure more than of God. Truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, and despisers of those that are good. You say, that's communists. No, that's Christians, so-called. I'm church members. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Saying, oh, God did that in another age, not this age. The Bible said, from such turn away. We're living in that day. Now, I'm going to give you a scripture and call the prayer line. As I spoke today at the dedication, everything's perfected in threes. Jesus comes in threes. God is in three. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Them three are one. Justification, sanctification, and baptism of the Holy Ghost. Those three are one. When a baby is born in natural birth, first thing comes from a mother's water, blood, spirit. When Jesus died at the cross, he gave what it constitutes to make the new birth. Water, blood, and spirit. All things of the natural type the spiritual. Or the spiritual type the natural. Either way. Now notice. And this, the coming of Jesus is three times. Did you know that? Jesus come the first time to redeem his bride. He comes the next time we're caught up in the air to meet him in the air. We caught up to meet him. He comes to receive his bride. The next time he comes, he comes as king and queen to reign on the earth with his bride. Three comings. Right. And the church is in three stages. Let him that's filthy, filthy still. Let him that's holy, righteous, righteous still. Let him that's holy, holy still. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. How many knows that Jesus said that? Say amen. amen. What was it? A day just like that day. Look at perversion, homosexual. Picked up a paper last week when I was in Los Angeles, the Christian businessmen's meeting where I was their speaker. And homosexual is on the increase 40% over last year. Boys, men living with one another, living in hotel rooms, perversion, the natural course of life being perverted because women have belittled themselves and become so common. It's perverted man, perverted minds, women living with women, man living with man, just what God said would take place. As it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. What's the order? There was Sodom, the ungodly. There was Lot and his bunch, the lukewarm church member. You admit that? He had a form of godliness but went out into the world. That's where the church member went. There was Abraham, the elected and called out. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I feel religious right now. Them three classes of people are in the world today. The world, the ungodly, the lukewarm church member, and the elected and called. Watch when God got ready to destroy him. Jesus said, as it was in that day, so will it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Watch the perversion. Now, Abraham was setting poor. 
in the minority, sitting out under the oak. And he raised up his eyes and he saw three M-A-N coming. They looked like men. They had dust on their clothes. And they said they were strangers and they were passing through. But there was something in the heart of Abraham that he knew they were more than men. He ran out to him and said, come back and sit under the oak just a little bit. Watch now, shadowing the coming of Jesus, he said. Sit down here just a minute. I'll fetch a little water and wash your feet. Arrest yourself and I'll bring you a morsel of bread. Refresh yourself. Then go on about your business. For this is why you come by. Let's take Abraham. He run into the tent. Sarah was 90 years old. Abraham was 100. They were looking for a baby and believed God, holding on, just certain God was going to answer like a preached on tonight. 25 years they held for that promise, giving God praise all the time for the baby. Her getting older all the time, but they were certain of God. What happened? All of a sudden, Abraham ran into the tent. He said, Sarah, get out the flour, knead a little of it. In other words, sift it right good. Make some whole cakes down here. And he ran out into the flock and began to feel around, got a little fat calf, killed it, tucked, dressed it, brought it out and cooked it, and sat down and they eat it. I can see Abraham get the fly bush. Begin to, how many knows what a fly bush is? How many of y'all from Kentucky anyhow? See? All right, a fly bush. We never know what a screen door was until just recently. We had an old limb off of a tree or mom make a fly bush. We'd have to stand in old cabins and shoo the flies away from the table while we eat. Abraham out there with the fly bush. I don't get they had screens in those days. And while they were eating, Abraham's heart was beaten. You know what the Bible said it was? It was almighty God and two angels. Hallelujah! In the form of man. A preacher said to me not long ago, said, listen, Brother Branham, you don't mean to tell me that you believe that man was God. I said, the Bible said it was God. Amen. Yes, sir, in the form of man. Oh, said, how could he be? I said, you don't know our God. What's this body made of? Sixteen elements of the earth. Potash, calcium, petroleum, cosmic lights. God just reached over and got a handful of each one. He said, step in here, Gabriel. We're going down to Sodom. Step in here, Michael. And breathe one for himself. Walked right down here in human flesh. Don't tell me he wasn't God. Abraham said he was Elohim, the great God Jehovah. He wasn't a theosophy neither. He wasn't a vision. He actually eat the meat of that calf, drink the milk from the cow, and eat cornbread. He was a man. There he was sitting there. See if it isn't spelled capital L-O-R-D. Any of you Greek scholars, look what the word means. Elohim. The Jehovah. You just don't know who God is. I may not be, I may go back. Here the other night I was combing these two or three hairs I got left. My wife said to me, said, Billy, you, she's sitting there laughing at me now. She said, Billy, you're almost bald-headed. I said, I haven't lost a one of them. She said, pray tell me where they're at. I said, you tell me where they was before I got them. I'll tell you where they are waiting for me. The Bible said the hairs in your head is numbered. One of them's a fairy. There was one time they wasn't nothing. And then they was. And they went back to where they was before I had them. So will this body be someday that calcium potash will go back. But God will speak and I'll jump from the earth. That's my God. He holds the whole world in his hand. He just blows the stars off, made the solar system, spoke his word, and it was so. The very dirt that you're sitting over is his word made manifest. If it didn't, where did it come from? The dirt that you're walking on is his word made manifest. He said, let there be, and there was. I believe every word that he says is the truth. No matter how long it lingers, it's so anyhow. Here was this man. Now notice, he kept looking towards Sodom. And two angels got up and went on down to Sodom. There wasn't very much miracles performed, just one little thing. 
But they went out there and preached to the sodomites, a modern Billy Graham and a Vanzig. Preached down there to that world, a great congregation they had. But this one angel that stayed behind, I want you to notice, he preached to the elect, the church, the called out. Watch how you done it. Now he was a stranger. Listen now, you'll miss it. Now Jesus said, as it was then, so will it be in the coming of the Son of Man. The gospel preached by God to mortal being. Notice, this man stood and looked at Abraham. Women, them days, wasn't like they are now. Every time somebody comes up in the yard, a woman's got to put on her, her little shorts and go out in the yard and see what her husband's talking about. But into his business, shame on you. Shame on you, man. If you got no more man about you, let your wife do that. It's all right, I guess. Good. That was wrong about it. I, I don't take it back. That's the truth. Now, that's just the truth. I got little respect for a man to let his wife do a thing like that. Smoke cigarettes and drink whiskey and wear those kind of clothes. Man's not measured by how big a muscle he's got. He's measured by the bag in the knees of his pants where he prays. Man is not measured by muscle, that's beast. He's measured by character. There never was a greater man than Jesus Christ. And the Bible said there's no beauty of him we should desire him. Little stoop-shouldered, thin fella. But in him was God, character. Man is measured by character. I've seen man that weighed 250 pounds and throw a baby out of a mother's arms and ravish her. You call that man? I call that beast. Now, listen. This man sitting there, he said, Abraham, where is your wife, Sarah? A stranger. How did he know she was married? He was married. How did he know that his wife's name was Sarah? What's that angel? What message he gave? Abraham said, she's in the tent behind you. And the Bible said that the angel had his back turned to the tent. Behind him. Said, where is Sarah, your wife? How do you know that he had a wife and how do you know her name was Sarah? What's the nature of that spirit now to the elected church? The gospel is wrote between the lines, as same as on the line. He's hid it from the eyes of the wise and prudent and revealed it to babes such as will learn. Jesus thanked God for it. So do I. Don't take the seminary experience, it takes a neology experience to know God. And he said, you see, I'm going to keep it a secret from Abraham. He's going to be heir of the world. He said, Sarah, your wife's going to conceive. I'm going to visit you about the time of life, 28 days for Sarah. For a, nearly 100 years old. That time had ceased with her 40, 50 years before. I'm going to visit her according to the time of life. You're going to have this child. And Sarah, inside the tent, laughed within herself. And the angel with his back to the tent said, Why did Sarah laugh? Oh, I hope you're not so numb by the things of the world that you don't pick that up. Don't you see the nature of the same angel just before the coming of the Lord? Jesus said, as it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Surely not spiritual dead enough not to recognize that. The discernment, just at the end of time of the Jews, God sent that spirit. Just at the end of time of the Samaritan, he sent that spirit. Just at the end before judgment, when he's going to burn the world up, Sodom and Gomorrah, he sent that angel as a witness. And bombs are hanging under, ready to blow this world into bits in one minute's time. There's Billy Graham and them evangelists out under punching that Sodom and Gomorrah. And the angel of the Lord with the elected church, the called out group, showing signs and wonders. Of discernment. So shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Let us pray. Lord, no man can come except you draw him. How can a man understand unless God reveals himself to man? Now, Father, there is the word that your word and it shall not fail. Heavens and earth will pass away, but your word will never fail. Let it be known tonight, Lord, that you're God. 
and your spirit to share in your church dealing with your people. In the name of Jesus Christ, we submit ourselves to thee for the service. Amen. Now it's immaterial to me. If the Holy Spirit would come into this meeting right now and would say thus to me, say such a thing, give discernment out in there to you people, it ought to convince you. Now remember, it's not the hands of a preacher that heals the people. That's a Jewish tradition. The little man Zacchaeus that had his, not Zacchaeus, but the, his, his daughter died. Can't think of his name right now. When his daughter died, he said to Jesus, Come, lay your hands on my daughter and she will live. He's a Jew. But when the Roman centurion had his servant at the point of death, he said, I'm not worthy that you come under my roof. Just speak the word. My servant will live. Jesus turned and said, I don't find faith like that in Israel. That's what we Gentiles ought to be. But we have to fall back to our traditions, laying on of hands and so forth. But that's what it takes. All right. We're here to serve the law. Now, we don't have, we line up people and pray for them. Last night, we had a straight line of discernment. Every person coming through the line, everybody was sure to raise up their hand. And note it was true, every wit and people out through the audience without prayer cards, raise up your hand. They're sure last night, we've seen it. All right, there you are. Mouth of two or three witnesses, every word be established. Tonight, we said, we would just line up the people that had leftover prayer cards and pray for them. Tonight, just passing through the line. Now, it doesn't matter to me, either way. But remember, the same God that was here last night to give discernment is the same God here tonight. Could you give out any prayer cards today? How many? Fifteen, fifty last now that make a hundred. All right. Prayer card Z. We'll have to call them in numbers. Prayer card Z. Number one. Raise up your hand. Prayer card. I surrender my will to the law. Now you that is that all the prayer cards? Is there any more prayer cards in the house? No more prayer cards. All right. This is our first meeting. All right. This is our first meeting. We're born maybe miles apart and first time we've ever met. Now here is a perfect picture of St. John, the fourth chapter. A man and a woman meets for the same first time in life. How many know that? Jesus began to talk to the woman. And then he found where her trouble was. And he told her what her trouble was. And she said, Sir, now the Pharisees, the preachers and so forth, said that man's a fortune teller, Beelzebub, the devil. Anybody knows that fortune telling is of the devil. All seance and fortune telling is of the devil. But what is the fortune teller? Something that the devil has perverted. It could be a child of God, but the devil made a child of hell out of him. See? But the, Jesus talked to the woman when he told her where her trouble was. She said, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. We know, we Samaritans know, that when the Messiah cometh, he'll tell us these things. But who are you? He said, I'm he that speaks to you. And she left her water bucket and went into the city and said, Come see a man that told me the things that I've done. Isn't this the Messiah? How many of you ever read that in the Scripture? All ever read the Bible. Eh? Now, if Jesus Christ, what my contention is, the same yesterday, today, and forever, the same act can take place. Of course, a woman might not be guilty of sin like that, but for some reason she's standing here. I don't know. I've never met her. But God does know her. 
If God will reveal to me what you're here for, will you believe me to be his prophet? If you, you, will, you do believe me. Thank you. I'm being servant. The word prophet kind of scatters people sometimes. You feel it resented. See, of course, a preacher is a prophet. But a seer, one who sees vision. I'm not a preacher. I have no education to be a preacher. I stumble around. I like to tell what I know about it. But a real scholarly educated preacher would never class me as a preacher. But my gift to God, he knows I love him, and he's given me a gift of discernment. There sits my wife. She's known me since I was a boy and seen tens of thousands of cases and seen me when the visions come to sometime I'm unconscious for an hour or two. Just seeing visions that come up and claim it and tell the people and not one time has it ever failed. That has to be God. Now, if the Holy Spirit will reveal to me what you're here for or something about you that you know I don't know, you'll believe it's the Holy Spirit and you'll accept it. How many of the audience would accept the same thing, raise your hand. Now be reverent. Now, now look where the drama set. Now the Bible's going to be found to be truth or uh, error. I'm going to be found a false prophet or telling you the truth. If I tell the truth, God will vindicate the truth. If I tell a lie, God will show it that it's a lie. But his word can't lie. That's the reason I'm sure, I'm positive, I'm telling you the word of the Lord is God's promise. Now, believe. Let's see what he'll say. I don't say that he will. Then the rest of it. All of you in a prayer line will believe it anyhow, whether God says anything to you or not. Would you be willing just to pass through the prayer line? If you will, raise your hand. Now, you're just pass through and lay hands on. If God's this close to you here on the platform, to know the very secret of your heart. Here this woman and I with her hands up, the Bible ain't here. We've never seen each other before in life. If we did, we didn't know it. I don't know her, know nothing about her, but God does. Let him reveal it and see whether it's truth or not. I see the woman coming from a distance. She's not from here. From Chattanooga. That's right. You're suffering with a tumor. And the tumor is not visible to me now, but it's located under your right arm. If that's right, raise up your hand. You believe now? That you might see that it wasn't guessing. Look to me, sister. Let me see what he said. Now, see, I don't know what I told you. The only way I ever know is them tapes. I pick it up, see what he said. Yes, I see you doing something under your, oh, it's a, it's a tumor under your arm. And then there's your death in your left ear. That's right. That's true. Ella is your name. You can return home. Jesus Christ will make you well. Miss Ellen Blackburn, go home to Chattanooga and be made well in the name of Jesus Christ. Do you believe? Now have faith in God. Lord Jesus, I lay my hands upon the woman and pray for her in the name of Jesus for her healing. Amen. Don't doubt now. Don't let this drop. I, I know what's wrong with the feet. You believe that? Look here. Go eat your supper. The stomach trouble left you. You had a nervous stomach for a long time. Go eat now. Jesus makes you well. Now you believe, sister? In the name of the Lord Jesus, may she be healed. Amen. God, in the name of Jesus Christ, let our brother be healed. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, let our sister be healed. O Lord, may it be as I lay hands upon her, may she be healed in Jesus' name. Come, sister. You believe your back trouble's done? Just walk on. If thou canst believe, now what's the matter? What let down? Don't you believe that those people... God knows their heart the same as he knows the first woman's heart. Now don't you see what a time I have in America? One of those cases in South Africa, 
Every person on the ground with a wheel car stretcher, they take seven truckloads of wheelchairs and stretchers from one thing being done like that, and the next morning, them blanket heathens walking down the street in Durban, South Africa, singing only belief, behind seven truckloads where 25,000 miracles was performed in one minute. And we are smart and educated, see, and we sit like a war on a pickle. Don't know. The ox knows his star. The mule knows the master's crib. My people knows not. Well, that ought to shake your heart to say, Lord God, I am healed. I believe it. Here, I see a little woman sitting here praying right here now, up here, sitting on the end of the road right here looking at her head against her hand, leaning up on it, suffering with the trouble with her leg. You believe God will heal you? If you do, the sister right above there got something wrong with your back. Do you believe in Jesus Christ will make you well? If you do, accept it and believe it and you can get well. You think God can heal your diabetes and make you well? You have a prayer card, but you have diabetes. I mean you had diabetes. Jesus Christ heals you. Will you do me a favor? The lady sitting right next to you has got heart trouble. And she wants to be prayed for too. Is that right? Raise up your hand. I didn't touch you. You didn't touch me. But you touched the high priest. And he acts the same as he did the woman that touched his garment. Go home and be well. Those people have no prayer for them. See, it's the sovereign grace of God. Why can't you catch it? Here. Here's a dear woman. I don't know her. We're strangers. Now, if I talk to every person, just a few of them, I get so weak I can't stand here. Well, there was one, that one little woman that touched Jesus' garment. He said it made me weak. Is that right? Virtue went from me. If it would make virtue go from the Son of God, what would it do to me, a sinner, saved by grace? I couldn't do one if it wasn't. And he said, these things that I do shall you do, and more than this shall you do. It's his promise. For I go to the Father. I don't know you. You don't know me. If the Lord will reveal to me what's your trouble, would you believe it? You know that it, it well, you know where it's the truth or not. All right. May the Lord grant it so this people can see and not set me down. The woman is not here for herself. She's here for her son. And her son is a mental case. He received the baptism of the Holy Ghost some time ago. And now he's got all nervous. He can't think. He can't hold his job. That's the truth. Take that handkerchief in your hand and lay it on him. Don't doubt, and he'll come to himself and serve the Lord. Don't believe it. Do you believe God? Unbelievable. Lord God, in the name of Jesus Christ, come with these little ones. Oh, Father God. In the name of the Lord Jesus, I bless them. May they be healed. Come, my brother. Lord, in the name of the Lord Jesus, bless and heal my brother. Amen. Come, sister. Oh, Lord, as she passes by, may it not be like passing by a man, but may she know that Jesus, the Son of God, is here. His Spirit is here. And if they laid in the shadow of St. Peter and Mathilde, an ignorant fisherman that couldn't write his name, it wasn't that ignorant fisherman, it was your spirit, Lord, that they recognized. May this woman pass by the anointing of the Holy Ghost and be healed in Jesus' name. Amen. Come, Sister Woods, I know you, so come here. Lord God, this woman I know, her crippled boy, that was a crippled, infantile paralysis drove his leg up behind him. They slipped into a meeting and you spoke and called his name and brought him out and straightened that crippled leg till he doesn't know which one was crippled now. His mother's sick. She needs healing, Lord. Let the power of God that straightened David's leg heal my sister. I ask it in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Bless you, Sister Wood. I wonder if David's close. A boy, his father was a Jehovah Witness. His father's filled with the Holy Ghost. He could give you testimony of his brother 
How many read about the little fish coming to life that time? It was his brother that was standing present. David, where are you? David Wood. Stand up. There was a boy, a polio case, his leg drawn up behind him, sitting way back in the audience in a big tent meeting, and the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, Thus saith the Lord. There he is, a witness that God heals polio. Amen. Oh, I feel like a holy roller. Amen. I feel like shouting. If it takes that to serve God, then let me do it. I've sailed the seven seas, traveled the world six times around, and I've never yet seen a holy roller. It's a black guard name that the devil tapped on the saints of God. There's no such a thing. I've done 969 different denominations from the government registered, and not one of them is called holy roller. There's no such a thing. Come, little lady. You believe God? Lord God, in the name of Jesus Christ, may the girl get well. Amen. Believe, sister. Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, may the lady get well. Amen. Come, sister. Lord, I lay hands upon the woman and the child. In the name of Jesus Christ, may they be healed. Come, sister. I see you. Don't let down. When you come by here, start praising God. When you're prayed for, I don't care if it takes 25 years. If you're the children of Abraham, then you've got the faith of Abraham. That discernment don't have to be each time. Here. Are we strangers to one another? I don't know you. You don't know me. But God knows us both. Do you believe that that... I want you to be witness to the congregation. Here's a woman that has faith. Right now, there's a real strange feeling on you. Like sweet, consoling, comforting. How many ever seen the picture that the government taken of the angel of the Lord got in the house of George J. Lacey's examination, the head of the FBI, said it was an angel of the Lord. The light struck the lens of the camera. Said the camera won't take psychology. That same life hanging on that woman right now. That's what makes her feel that way. Now, this is like another dimension to you scientists. It just places me over to a place that I'm looking at the woman, and I know as soon as I look to her and keep my thoughts to her, and the Holy Spirit help me, he'll tell me about her. She's here to be prayed for for a foot that's bothering her. That thus saith the Lord. That's truth, isn't it? Now, you say you guessed it. All right, see if we did. That was not a guess. You've got somebody else you're praying for. That's your grandson. <laughs> and he's got his neck broke. And he's in a government hospital, an army government hospital, not here, but in Missouri. That's thus saith the law. <laughs> Go and believe and receive her in the name of the Lord Jesus. Come believe me. Oh, Lord, heal her, I pray in Jesus' name. Grand. Young man, you're nervous, upset. Don't you know God can heal nerves? Now, it's hard for a nervous person to get a hold of it. You've been wanting a place to place your foot, see? Your great thinker crossing bridges before you get to it and taking other things. Don't do it no more. You don't feel bad now. It's off of you now. If you go believe me, it'll never come on you again. In the name of Jesus Christ, believe it. Lord God, in the name of the Lord Jesus, heal this woman, I pray. Lord God, I pray that you'll heal our sister as she passes by. Not by me, but under the cross. In the name of the Lord Jesus, heal this dear person, Father, as she passes by. Grant it, Lord. You're shattered to death with heart trouble, but you believe God will heal your heart? Then go as you have believed, may it be to you. Another shattered to death with cancer. Do you believe God will heal the cancer? Then go and rejoice and be happy. Can't you believe? Say this lady sitting right back out here suffering with headaches. Do you believe God will heal you? If you do, receive your healing. Amen. Blessed be the Lord. Here's a little woman sitting here with a white uniform on. She just touched the Lord. She's got hip trouble. She fell and hurt her hip. That's right, isn't it, lady? You're sitting there praying and you said, Lord, let him call me. He was praying and just saying, you touched the high priest. Now you'll get well. Jesus Christ heals you. Amen.
I challenge your faith to believe God. I say in the name of Jesus, you believe. You believe God will heal that asthma? Sitting right back there? If you believe it with all your heart, you can have it. You believe, sister? In the name of Jesus Christ, may you be healed. Do you believe, sister? In the name of the Lord Jesus, be healed. I just don't understand. Why can't you catch it, friend? No matter what is a vision or not, don't you know the same God is the same one who knows all about you? Got a growth in your mouth. Is that right? I don't know you. God knows you. Miss Carol, that's your name. You're from Dalton, Georgia. Return home. Believe and it'll get well. I don't doubt. Believe. Have faith in God. Amen. In the name of the Lord Jesus. God can heal that tumor if you let him. Believe him. In the name of Jesus. Lord God, I pray that you heal this woman in Jesus' name. In the name of the Lord Jesus, heal our sister. Come, brother. That's the Lord Jesus, heal our brother in Jesus' name. These signs shall follow them that believe. You believe I believe? You believe? Then these signs shall follow them that believe. If they lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. You believe it? Pass by. In the name of Jesus Christ, may you get well. Come, sister, crippled. You believe that God can heal that crippled boy sitting out there? Can make you well, too? Then give him praise and you'll get well. In the name of Jesus Christ. Come, sister. You believe? In the name of Jesus Christ, be made well. You believe, little boy? In the name of Jesus Christ, God heal this child. You believe, brother? In the name of Jesus Christ, may you be healed. You believe, sister? In the name of Jesus Christ, be healed. In the name of Jesus Christ, be healed. You believe, sister? In the name of Jesus Christ, be healed. In the name of Jesus Christ, be healed, brother. In the name of Jesus Christ, be healed. Come, sister. You believe with all your heart? In the name of Jesus Christ, may you be well. In the name of Jesus Christ, may my brother be healed. Come, sister. Get over that stomach trouble. Go eat now. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ. God, I pray that you'll heal her in Jesus' name. God, I pray that you heal our sister in Jesus' name. God, in Jesus' name, heal our brother. Lord God, in the name of Jesus Christ, heal our brother. Heavenly Father, it's written, they shall lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. In the name of Jesus Christ, I do this. Almighty God, I'll lay hands upon my brother. In the name of Jesus Christ, may he be healed. Amen. God bless you, Dad. In the name of Jesus Christ, I lay hands upon my sister for her healing. Come, sister. What you so nervous about? That's what caused your stomach trouble and got you the condition thing. You go get over it right now, aren't you? In the name of Jesus Christ, may it be so. Amen. Amen. Mother, that old heart's beat a long time. It's getting bad now, but if you'll believe, it'll keep beating. In the name of Jesus Christ, may she be healed. Grant it, Lord. Come, sister. In the name of Jesus Christ, may she be healed. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray you for you, my brother. Come, brother dear. Lord God, in the name of Jesus Christ, may my brother be well. In the name of Jesus Christ, may my brother be healed. In the name of Jesus Christ, may my sister be healed. In the name of Jesus Christ, I lay my hands upon the woman and ask for her healing. Amen. God, I lay hands upon my brother in the name of Jesus for his healing. Come, sir. In the name of Jesus Christ, I lay hands on my brother for healing. Come, sister. You believe with all your heart? Your back trouble will leave you. In the name of the Lord Jesus, grant me healing, Father. You have the same thing. I believe with all your heart in the name of Jesus Christ. You believe that that diabetes will leave you and you'll get well? You do? Go ahead. Believe that you shall have a blood transfusion of Christ. Do you believe me to be God's servant? You believe God can tell me what's wrong with you? 
Will you believe it? Whether you'll know it's the truth or not. You got nervousness and heart trouble. That's right. Your nervousness is what makes your heart trouble. It's a nervous heart. When you eat and lay down, flutters and has all kinds of sensations and feelings. It ain't going to kill you. Do you believe that, Louise? You live in Tennessee, Clinton, Tennessee, but you're not from Tennessee. You come from California, Los Angeles. Had a lot of trouble in your life. Lost a boy just recently in an automobile accident. That's thus saith the Lord. Believe on the Lord, your God. Go and receive your healing. Will you do it? May it be so in the name of the Lord. All right. Is that all of the prayer room? Are you convinced that Jesus Christ lives? Are you convinced that he said these things would happen just before the coming of the Lord Jesus? Then we're near the end of the journey. And the angel of God has come down into our midst and has proved himself to be the Son of God raised from the dead and fulfilling every word. How many in here that's not well and you want to be healed, raise up your hand. Oh my, I couldn't get through all of those. Will you believe me as God's servant? Do you believe that God would let me say something was wrong? God proves that I've told you the truth. Here, all that is believers, raise up your hand. Now lay your hands on somebody next to you. I'll give you a scripture, the same scripture said, these signs would be done like this. The same God said, these signs shall follow them that believe. If they lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. It's not me. It's not me. It's him. And it's not my hand. It's the hand of anybody. You believe it, sister? You believe it, dad? If you believe it, your deliverance is right at the door. Now, don't you pray for yourself. You pray for the person that you got your hands on. Let them pray back for you. The Bible said, confess your faults one to another and pray one for the other, that you might be healed. Now lay your hands on somebody next to you. Something just has to happen. Something has to happen. God's word is true. If you believe it, people get healed. There is that 